Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Isabel Bajeux, and I'm the Dean of the Desotel Faculty of Management at McGill University. It is my great pleasure and privilege to welcome you for this very special event. Bienvenue à tous, et merci d'être venus si nombreux pour cette soirée. I want to extend a warm welcome to our speakers, Yann Lequin and Matissa Olister, our professors, our alumni, our students, and our friends of Desotel, McGill, and all of our esteemed guests. What a treat to be here tonight. Thank you for joining us for the seventh Integrated Management Symposium entitled Disruption in the Workplace, Artificial Intelligence in the 21st Century. This symposium series is a premier initiative of the Marcel Desotel Institute of Integrated Management. We bring thought leaders to campus to discuss important management challenges that inspire reflection and action. It is thanks to the generosity of Marcel Desotel, our alumni and friends, that we are able to bring these knowledge sharing opportunities to the community. In fact, we are thrilled that Marcel is able to join us at this event. Marcel, may I ask you to please stand up so that our friends can recognize you. Marcel, we extend our deepest thanks for all that you have done for McGill, as well as your continued involv involvement. Now, I'm sure they're all excited to get on with the main event, work. It is a crucial component of a dignified life. It provides us with income in addition to a sense of purpose, identity, and social recognition. Computing and robotic technologies have changed and reduced the need for human labor in areas such as manufacturing, logistics, and retail. Meanwhile, artificial intelligence is gaining ground in areas such as accounting, medicine, finance, and law. Just last month, Facebook announced the opening of a new artificial intelligence research lab in Montreal, headed by McGill's own professor, Joël Pinault, from the School of Computer Science. There is no doubt that disruptive technologies are creating new opportunities, but they're also resulting in new challenges for workers, industry, and policymakers who are trying to keep up. Tonight, our speakers will explore how work and careers are changing in light of advancement, advances in AI. Who better to provide insight than Yann Lequin, director of AI research at Facebook and silver professor at New York University. Yann and I have known each other for a long time. We're both from the same suburbs of Paris and uh, immigrated to North America in the 19th. Jan is widely considered one of the founders of deep learning, along with colleagues like Joshua Benjo from the Université de Montréal, who is also here tonight, and Geoffrey Hinton from the University of Toronto. They call themselves the Free Musketeers. Jan's research interest include AI, machine learning, mobile robotics, and computational neuroscience. He's best known for his contributions to the convolutional network model. This model is widely used in products and services deployed by companies such as Facebook, Google, Microsoft, and IBM. He has published over 180 papers and book chapters on these topics. He is the recipient of multiple awards. Last weekend, 
he was just inducted into the US National Academy of Engineering. Wired Magazine put him on the 2016 list of global influencers, a list of 25 geniuses who are creating the future of business. We're very grateful that Jan took the time to be with us tonight. We're equally delighted to hear from Matissa Olister, Assistant Professor of Organizational Behavior at the Desotel Faculty of Management. Matissa's research examines our careers, employment practices, and the employer-employee relationship have changed over the past four decades. A particular focus has been on the shift from long-term stable jobs to short-term employment, its causes and consequences. Her research has been published in top journals and supported by grants such as the National Science Foundation. Matissa holds a PhD in sociology and social policy from Harvard University and a master's in urban studies and planning from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. She's also a world champion in the sport of ultimate frisbee. <laughs> Thank you, Matissa, for facilitating tonight's discussion. And now, without further ado, Please join me in welcoming our two speakers to the stage. So I want to start by thanking you for coming and thanking all of you in the audience for uh, attending this very interesting event. And I've been asked to start with a uh, very brief overview of my research and how it connects to today's topic to provide some context of my interests. Uh, so as already mentioned, I've been studying the changing nature of careers and the employer-employee relationship over the last four decades, and a lot of my work has focused on documenting the shift from long-term jobs where there was an expectation that you would work mostly with one employer and look for internal promotions to the shift to shorter-term work and expectation of careers that would span multiple employers. Um, this may seem like an obvious trend for you. Uh, surprisingly, the most everyone that I talk to thinks that this is an obvious trend, but actually when you look at government uh, labor force statistics, both in the US and Canada, it's proven to be actually quite difficult to find evidence of this trend in the past, and there's many other researchers who have previously concluded that there's not much happening here. So my most recent research actually shows that there is, in fact, evidence of a trend toward short-term jobs, um, that this was actually being masked by a separate conflicting trend. And so this move toward short-term work is relevant for today's topic in two ways. One is that um, technological change is uh, likely a cause of the shift toward short-term work. Uh, more rapid technological change means that skills become obsolete faster, and so there's less of an incentive for employers and potentially even employees to develop and maintain a long-term employment relationship. Uh, I think the, the AI seems to pretend an even faster pace of technological change, and so my research on how workers are adapting and developing new career strategies in the face of this change uh, gives us some insight into the future of work. Um, the second part, though, is that I don't think that technological change is the sole reason for the shift to short-term work. Other factors include the rise of global competition, the increasing power of shareholders, which tend to focus more on short-term profits, the declining power of unions. And this has led to uh, an increasing view of workers as a cost that needs to be minimized. And so my second connection to this talk is I worry a little bit about the context in which AI is being developed and implemented and how this might impact these trends. So with that background, um, we're going to back up a little bit, we'll be getting to these topics, but we're going to start with a much more basic question, which is uh, AI is often quite difficult to define what exactly is artificial intelligence, but one definition that I saw that I liked quite a bit was that uh, AI is what's ever on the horizon, that as soon as a um, as soon as the technology becomes reality, it seems a little less mysterious, a little less intelligent, um, and that the, it's that cutting edge that's seen as artificial intelligence. And at the moment, that cutting edge is machine learning, but even more specifically, deep learning that you've been very central in. So could you describe, hopefully in as little technical language as possible, uh, what is deep learning and how is it different from previous evolutions of AI? 
So machine learning, of course, was there at the beginning of the appearance of AI. People have been working on AI since the 50s, and, or, or the, the phrase that was coined in the, in the 50s. And, and very early on, people realized learning was uh, probably going to be an, an important component of, uh, of artificial intelligence. But there's been several waves of, uh, of interest in machine learning techniques. The, the first wave was uh, in the late 50s, early 60s, and it kind of died out. Uh, for, for a number of years and then reappeared in the 80s and then died out again and now it's reappearing under the, the name of, of deep learning. Um, so what, what deep learning is, the reason it's called deep, is, uh, is, be, is by contrast with previous machine learning techniques that you know, we could call shallow, but that would be unfair. Mm -hmm. um, essentially, the traditional machine learning techniques uh, do relatively simple computation uh, so instead of programming a machine directly by writing a sequence of, uh, of instructions, like in traditional um, uh, programming, you, you, you write a relatively short program which has lots of parameters that are adjustable, and then you train the machine to find the setting of the parameters that will get the machine to do what you want. And so a typical example is that you want to train a machine to recognize speech or recognize uh, objects in images. You collect lots of images of, say, cars and airplanes, and you show an image of a car to the machine. You wait for it to produce an answer. And if the answer is different from, from car, then you tell it, you got the wrong answer. Here is the correct answer. And it adjusts the internal parameters so that next time you show the same image, the answer will be closer to the one you want. And then you show an airplane, and then show a car again, and show an airplane again. And every time, you adjust the parameters a little bit. And eventually, all the parameters converge to uh, a configuration that will allow the machine to recognize any plane from any car, um, or you know, dogs, or cats, or tables, or chairs, and people. Um, so uh, in the past, the, the part of the machine that was able to uh, trained this way was relatively simple, and much of the work had to be done uh, through engineering by constructing a, a, a way for the machine to represent the images, for example, in, in such a way that the learning algorithm could actually do something with it. Um, and that required a lot of manual intervention, a lot of uh, uh, skills and sort of engineering. It was very expensive and brittle. And then deep learning, what bring, deep learning is, is basically a way to automate this part. So instead of having a piece of the system that is handcrafted and a piece that's trained, the entire system is trained. And it's called deep because the, you can sort of conceptually see the system as being composed of multiple layers of processing. So the image is fed at one end, and then it gets processed by sort of these multiple layers. And then at the end, it produces an output. And all those layers are trained from end to end simultaneously. That's why it's called deep learning. Um, the, what, what this technique has brought to the table is the uh, over the last um, five years or so, even though the, the, the basic techniques are very old, they, they are 30 years old or 25 years old, uh, but over the last five years, because of the uh, increase in the power of computers and be, because of the availability of large data sets on which to train those systems, we've seen an in incredible improvement in the performance of image recognition systems, video analysis systems, speech recognition uh, systems, and uh, text understanding systems, text tr uh, translation, language translation systems. So all of those systems now deployed by all the big companies use deep learning. When you talk to your phone, uh, and the phone kind of recognizes your, 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 your query or your search query if you're on Google or, or, or whatever, it's a deep learning system that understands your speech. Uh, when uh, a post from one of your friends uh, who's you know, is posting in a foreign language you don't understand is posted on Facebook and that is translated automatically in the language you understand. That's also done by a deep learning system. Uh, all the work on self-driving cars that you hear about, uh, there's a lot of companies that are very excited about the, the possibility of having autonomous cars. Uh, that all uses deep learning. Um, and, and we're going to see a lot more applications of this in the near future. And so one of the differences from really very other different approaches to artificial intelligence in terms of machine learning as a more general principle is that uh, you're not telling the machine this is what a car looks like. You're telling the machine here's a bunch of data and you figure out the pattern uh, that defines what a car is and it's learning. That's what it means by it's learning, right? That's right. That's uh, right. And then the deep learning is just allowing that learning to be much more complex than before. Yeah, basically to feed the machine directly with uh, the raw image. Right. So an image to a computer is, is a table of numbers, right? It's the value of the pixels. 
and uh, whether there is a cat in that picture, uh, when it comes to you as, as a bunch of numbers, it's very difficult. So it's also very difficult for the computer to figure out. Uh, so th those deep learning systems, there's a particular type of architecture called convolutional nets, which uh, Isabel mentioned uh, that had to, something to do with uh, a long time ago, uh, are designed to um, essentially process uh, uh, the type of data that comes to you in the form of an array, whether it's an image or a video or text or, or something of that, uh, of that nature. And um, uh, what, um, what the systems are based on is they're very, they're very much inspired by a little bit of you know, the neuroscience and biology. Um, it's, uh, it's kind of a very tenuous inspiration, a little bit the same way uh, airplanes are inspired by birds, right? I mean, the birds are a proof of existence of heavier than air flight, and they inspired the early designers of airplanes, and it's a bit of the same thing with those deep learning systems, which are sometimes, sometimes we call them deep neural nets, uh, because they, they are a little kind of inspired by um, how the brain is structured. And people sometimes refer to deep learning as uh, being a black box system. So what does that mean and why, why does that come up that way? So the, a lot of the applications of deep learning are applications uh, that have to do with perception. So things that are, you know, in, in the human mind are subconscious, right? We cannot explain how we, how we recognize images. And in fact, that's precisely why we cannot write a program to recognize images, because we can't really formalize how an image is being, is being recognized, how a particular object is being recognized. Um, so, uh, so a lot of the tasks that those systems are doing are kind of you know, below the sort of verbal level, if you want, the, the, the conscious level that, uh, uh, in, in sort of similar human tasks. And so the same way, it's very hard to um, you know, ask your taxi driver to explain to you why uh, you know, he turned the wheel in a particular way at a particular time, it's hard to ask a neural net to uh, tell you why it made this particular decision. But it's not really a black box in the sense that, you know, we, it's a computer program, we can analyze everything that goes on, goes on inside, we can uh, figure out, you know, how to change the input to change the outputs. It's, I mean, there's a lot of uh, things we know about this. So this, this notion of black box is a bit of a legend, actually. Yeah, but, and, but one part of it is sort of that it's not geared toward explaining how the world works. It's geared towards learning how the world works, and it doesn't necessarily provide an explanation. Right? Yeah, that's right. So the, the, it would be a separate process to train a system to provide an explanation a yeah. posteriori after the system has made okay. a decision. Yeah. Um, uh, by default, the, the systems are, you know, just perform a prediction, and, and you know, explanation may, may come later. Right, they're learning. Right. And one thing you wanted to comment on was that uh, you think that uh, these machines are not necessarily advanced, as advanced right now as people think. Right. So it's very easy to get a little confused when, uh, when a, a machine does a particular feat at a level that is above human performance. Like, you know, those systems can do, uh, you know, they can, you train them to recognize images and they can recognize, you know, obscure species of plants from the shape of the yeah, of, of, the, of the leaves, or they can recognize, you know, breeds of dogs or, or species of birds, right? And most people can't do this. I mean, some people who train themselves to do this can. Uh, so in a sense, the performance of the system is superhuman in certain very narrow area, uh, areas. And it's, it's very easy to assume then that they have the same kind of intelligence as humans who are capable of doing this, but they don't. They're, they're just trying to do this particular task. Um, and, uh, and if you change the situation just a little bit, they will probably not, not do a good job. So we can do what's called narrow AI at the moment, but not general AI. We don't have machines that, we don't even have the basic principles to build machines that are as intelligent as, um, you know, let's say a rat or a cat, let alone a human. Um, and what's missing there is that the, the process I described previously for training a neural net is what's called supervised learning. So it's uh, the, the the scenario by which you, you, know, you show an image or a text to a machine and then you tell it what the correct answer is. So it's a little bit like, like showing a, a picture book to a, to a small child and you know, here's an elephant and you say it's an elephant and after a few example, the examples of that, the, 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 the child kind of recognizes the concept, right? So it's like this except we need thousands of examples of each of the, each of the categories uh, for in, in most cases. Um, there is the, most of the learning that humans and animals do is, is not of this type. We, we learn most of what we know about the world by just observing or by interacting with uh, objects. And, uh, and that kind of learning, we don't quite know how to do yet. We, we have some ideas. We, 
All of us are working very actively on trying to find ways to make this work, but it doesn't quite work. And until we find ways to do this, we're not going to have truly intelligent machines. Um, um, and you know, it's a necessary condition to make uh, significant progress towards uh, general intelligence, but it's not, it's not a sufficient, sufficient one either. So we don't know what the next obstacle will be after that. So it might take a quite a long time before we have truly intelligent machines. Okay. Um, so you've already mentioned uh, a few applications of artificial intelligence. So at the moment, artificial intelligence is mostly being used in deep learning to learn a very specific and narrow task, as we just discussed. So what are the common characteristics of those tasks that, that, uh, that at the moment, deep learning is good at learning? What do you, what are the, what do you need uh, for that task in order to be able to train AI to do it and potentially do it better? So the thing that, for which those techniques work well are, are you know, anything that uh, a human can learn to do in less than, I mean, can learn to do in a long time, but then can perform in less than half a second or so. So <laughs> things that don't require a lot of thinking and reasoning and, and kind of uh, mulling over. So the you know, perceptual tasks are of this type. If you, uh, if you, if you look at a scene, uh, neuroscientists tell us that you can pretty much tell which objects are in your visual, you know, visual field uh, in less than 100 milliseconds, about you know, a tenth of a second or so. So any task that uh, animals and humans can do relatively quickly like this, uh, those, those things are, are, are pretty good for. What that translates into is, is tasks uh, that, for which you can collect thousands or millions of examples, and, and that those examples have been labeled by humans. So you know what output uh, is, is, is required to correspond to particular inputs. So you need a lot of data, oh, data, and often that means something that's that's done a lot, sort of repetitively, right. but not necessarily that you can have to be able to explain it, right? That's the advantage right. of, the, of the deep learning. And how about um, what jobs, what might characterize the kinds of tasks that are very unlikely to be learned by artificial intelligence anytime in the near future? Okay, um, so you have to put horizons, and it's very difficult because, yeah. as I said before, you know we might make some progress towards general intelligence, and in my opinion, that will take uh, you know, a few decades. Um, so, we, so we have some time. But, um, but before that, before that happens, so with the techniques that we currently uh, know about and their you know, extensions that, that will occur in the next few years, um, uh, the, 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 the type of task I think that can be automated are the ones for which we have lots of data, et cetera, for which there is an obvious mapping from input to output. So, there is sort of an easy decision to make that doesn't require a lot of uh, thinking, but maybe that requires to take into account a lot of different variables. Uh, then those, those systems can actually uh, do a better job than, than humans. And they, they would be more consistent about the decisions they make. Uh, they won't get tired. Uh, so for driving a car, for example, if we can, drive, if we, if we can build systems of this type that can drive cars, um, you know, accidents due to inattention, for example, would be reduced uh, by, uh, by a lot. So, that, that would be an uh, opportunity to save lives with, uh, with AI. Similarly, for uh, a, a very promising set of applications of uh, image recognition techniques, convolutional nets in particular, is for medical image analysis. And uh, so I, I think you know, in the near future, there's going to be automated systems that can um, essentially process a lot of uh, uh, medical images and sort of eliminate the simple cases and then send the, the more sort of tricky ones or difficult right. ones uh, or suspicious ones to, the, to the, the radiologists and the doctors who then will be able to concentrate on the difficult cases. So jobs that have more exceptions, tasks that have more exceptions, tasks that are not as routine, maybe somewhat creativity, although that's de debated in the long run. But. Yeah, right. So uh, there is actually quite a lot of work on uh, uh, training neural nets and, and deep learning systems to, to, uh, to create. Uh, images, for example, yeah. um, and or simul you know, um, simulate creation. But ultimately, I think what those systems are going to be used for are uh, uh, are sort of assisting creation. So there's going to be it, what it will do is that when you have a system that can uh, uh, you know turn a, a a rough line drawing into a painting in a particular style, and we already have technology like this. It would just allow a lot more people to be to to be creators. You know, the same way a lot of software that we you know that are available now for music co composition and creation is available, and that that has multiplied the number of people who can 
you know, uh, use their, their creative juices and produce music yeah. without necessarily being good, you know, uh, good musicians and, yeah. or playing instruments. So I think, I think this, this is going to be a, uh, it's going to be an effect of amplifying human creativity. And I think human creativity and human to human communication is what is going to become more valuable yeah. in the future. And um, so I wanted to discuss one example because I've been looking into it myself personally, which is using uh, the, the use that some companies are even doing now of, of what's called artificial intelligence to evaluate resumes and to recommend the best mm -hmm. job candidate. And um, what do you think about that application? Yeah, so there's a number of applications that uh, a number of uh, companies, large and small, have uh, wanted to apply to um, I mean, I wanted to use uh, machine learning techniques for. They're not yeah. necessarily deep learning techniques, by the way. Yeah. A lot of them use very simple machine learning techniques that were around 20 years ago. Okay. Um, and the, the problem with this is how to make sure that the decisions are uh, unbiased, perhaps less biased than the human decisions that are, right. that are, that are uh, otherwise made. Uh, and also, those systems generally are decision aids, so they don't actually make the decision. They produce outputs that are then interpreted by humans to make the decisions. And so these are situations where you want the system to actually produce explanations. Mm. Uh, so any decision about people's lives, like, you know, uh, do I job. offer you a job? Yeah. Do I uh, give you a mortgage? Uh, do I, you know, I'm a judge? Do I let you go on bail? Um, those are things that affect uh, people's lives. That's, you know, situations for which you want uh, uh, explanations yeah. uh, out of the system. And so the you know, there's, there's been um, uh, talks about the fact that uh, neural nets and deep learning are, 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 are sort of difficult uh, um, objects from which to generate explanations. I, I, I don't think that's the case. They're not, uh, they're not any more difficult than, more, than simpler techniques. They're just right. more difficult because they produce more, more accurate answers, basically. But one of the dangers of the deep learning, depending upon the application, is that it's, it's trained on real world, real world data. And therefore, um, one has to be very cautious about the data that it's being trained on, right? So yeah. it's not going to be better than a human. It's going to reflect whatever those human decisions that it's trained on is trained to. So if you use past hiring data to um, train your algorithm for hiring, then that data will reflect any biases that were in the humans, reflected in the humans that created that data in the first place. And so eventually, I think we discussed it, it might be possible to try and fix some of that. But at right. least at the moment, uh, at its most basic level, it's, it's learning the real world at its best and its worst at the same time. Well, so there, there's sort of two remarks on this. The first yeah. one is uh, you, you certainly, you can actually get machines that are better than any individual person right. who, who has generated the data, because the data generally is, is produced by an ensemble of, of people, and right. there is wisdom of the crowd to some yeah. extent, right? Mm -hmm. So individual variations are kind of smoothed out when you have uh, a large data, uh, data set that, you know, from, from multiple people. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so that's one point. The second point is there are techniques that people are working on. I wouldn't say they are completely kind of uh, uh, you know, recipes that everybody can apply, but there are, there is quite a lot of work on trying to sort of de-bias data in a way that if, uh, if there are certain variables that you don't want to be, you don't want to use, you don't want your system to use, not only that, but you don't want the system to use other variables that are correlated with it, uh, there are techniques that try to remove the information about those variables from the systems, and so in the end, you might get a system that is less biased than any human actually doing the same task. So, you know, when you decide whether to give a mortgage to someone, you don't want to use ethnicity for that. It's actually illegal in most right. countries. Um, but you also don't want to use the information, um, you know, in the address of the person. There is hidden information about their ethnicity in certain countries because people cluster. And so how do you eliminate this information? There's quite a bit of work on this. And I think, I'm, I mean, I'm very hopeful that uh, there's going to be uh, methods and sort of good uh, techniques to uh, uh, build systems of this type that actually are considerably less biased than corresponding human uh, decisions. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, I am interested also in the context in which AI is being implemented. And there's two aspects to that. One aspect is that it does seem like a lot of AI research is being funded and conducted uh, inside private companies, including your employer, Facebook, and uh, is this, should this be a concern? Does that influence the, the kinds of applications that companies, uh, that AI is being put to use for? 
So first of all, I, I should say that uh, it's true that uh, some companies have invested massively in, in AI research. Uh, but still, the majority of good ideas come from academia. Nice. <laughs> uh, many of them from, from here, from Montreal, right. from uh, Yosha Benjo's lab. Yeah. He's sitting yeah. right here from, from Mila. Um, and uh, the, 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 an interesting phenomenon has, ha has occurred in the last few years, which is that most companies that are involved in AI research actually practice open research. So it's certainly the case at Facebook, where uh, all the work that is done at Facebook AI research uh, is published, and most of the code is uh, distributed in open source. And the reason we're doing this is because we want to, we don't think AI is a solved problem, of course, and it's gonna take the entire research community to, to make significant progress. And so by uh, opening up our research, we're sort of um, you know, helping uh, the community as a whole to make progress in directions that we think is, uh, are, are, are important. And that had kind of ripples, r ripple effects in other companies. So uh, Google became more open than they were in the past. Um, Apple even started publishing papers, which they had never done before. Uh, so it's, it's producing a bit of a cultural uh, change in, in the attitude towards, uh, towards research. Um, and you know, it's, a, it's an old tradition. You know, practicing open research in companies uh, you know, was, was the rule in the, in the 70s and 80s with institutes like, institutions like, like Bell Labs, where I used to work. Uh, and uh, you know, Microsoft Research in recent years, uh, Xerox PARC, you know, various other companies. So after the upstream research has been done, and you publish papers, and you invent a new technique, you compare it on public data set, and you show that it works well, then it goes into product development. And that part is generally not, not uh, published, and it's you know, trained on internal data and everything, right. but, but the basic ideas are, are all published. So looking more specifically within the, the context in which AI is often implemented within a company, there's a paper that I often have my students read that was written by one of my former advisors and looked at the implementation of a technology that it turns out actually you were uh, part of developing, which was uh, check scanning software in banks. And um, in that paper, they had an interesting contrast where they looked at two different departments where the technology was introduced. And in one department, uh, they what had been a job where one, one position did four different tasks. The computer replaced one of those tasks, and the result was that they actually broke up the rest of the tasks into individual tasks, and that ended up with some pretty unappealing jobs. Uh, one of the jobs was literally taking out the staples and ordering the checks in the order to give the computer. Uh, another job was just typing in the, the numbers that the computer couldn't read. Um, interestingly, in contrast, the, the other department they consulted with the workers ahead of time. They actually had more specialized jobs looking at different types of exceptions to check problems. And in consultation with the workers, they actually did the opposite. They combined several tasks together. They um, created more, more complex, more interesting jobs and actually the, used the computer to take away the most frustrating and annoying part of their job. Um, and so the, the takeaway from that, and it actually emerges quite a few times in social science research on technology, is that um, the technology itself is not a determinant of how it impacts work, that how it's implemented and how it's developed uh, beforehand and put into place within the company makes a, a big difference as well. And so um, we were discussing before, and it seems like you took at least that consultation view uh, what have been with, uh, uh, with radiologists, so I wanted you to speak a little bit about that, that practice. Yeah, so I think what, what happens in the situation, so I think the situation you're referring uh, to with uh, check reading uh, Yosha Benjo and I, in the early 90s, were involved in, uh, uh, at AT&T Bell Labs in developing a check reading system, and this was deployed widely by a company called NCR, which at the time was a subsidiary of AT&T. And uh, by the late 90s, um, we were not connected with our project anymore because the company had split up, but uh, by the late 90s, the, the system that we, uh, we developed was reading on the order of 20% of all the checks in the US. And what it was doing was, essentially, it was a, a large machine that you put a stack of checks and it would kind of read the checks extremely quickly, uh, several thousand per minute, and, uh, and it would accept to read about half of the checks. So half of the check would be automatically read and, uh, and never seen by, uh, by humans within this bank. And then the other half would be sent to the to people you peers. were talking about. Yeah. So if, you know, I felt a little bad because you know, that's you know, half of the people being out of job. But in fact, no, they weren't out of job. But what happened is that this entire process kind of lowered the cost of, of processing for the banks and the, 
employees ended up doing other tasks that were actually probably less frustrating than you know, sitting at a screen reading checks all day. Mm. And so how about your work with the radiologist? How have you gone about with that? So radiology, so this is not work I'm, I'm uh, deeply involved in. Um, uh, some of my colleagues are considerably more involved than I yeah. am with uh, uh, medical image analysis. But I think uh, we're going to see a similar phenomenon where the simple cases are going to be handled by automated systems. And that will allow the, it will not reduce the number of radiologists that are, that are required. Uh, there's been uh, talks in the press about the fact that the, the job of radiology is going to disappear. Mm -hmm. I don't believe this at all. Uh, it's going to make the job more interesting, and it's going to allow the radiologists to spend more time on the cases that are difficult and to not miss uh, cases that they, they might miss because of inattention or because of uh, fatigue or things like this. You know, I've, I've sat next to radiologists uh, looking at uh, MRIs and, and, and CT scans, and they you know, they, they sit all day in front of a screen in the dark room uh, looking through slices of, uh, of photos and, and then, you know, writing reports and kind of, you know, pointing at uh, things. And uh, after a few hours of this, you, you, your attention is, is diminished. So, so I think uh, what, uh, what those automated systems will, will do is shorten the, uh, the turnaround time so you'll get a faster diagnosis, improve the reliability, and make the job of radiology a lot more interesting, I think. So the part, though, that I want to push on is the, the part that you sat down next to the radiologists, uh -huh. right? Um, how often is that the practice that an AI researcher says, I have an idea of a task. I'm going to go and actually meet the people doing that task and sit down with them and talk to them about what they like and don't like about their job and how can I make it better? Is that a common practice, or is it usually an AI researcher says, oh, I know how I, can, how I can do a task, and they go ahead and do it, and they don't really think about the worker? OK, so I think it's pretty rare for uh, sort of an AI scientist uh, in academia to do this, yeah. but, but it's not rare for for people who actually want to deploy uh, uh, AI technologies in the real world. Okay. So, you know, there's kind of a whole chain of, uh, right. of research and development, right, where the, the basic research might have been done 20 years ago and then, you know, it only became practical in the last few years, which is what happened with, uh, with deep learning. Uh, and there's, you know, still a lot of kind of theoretical research and, and, and basic research on this. But then there is a, a whole lot of people who want to apply this technology to various things, and they, they have to talk to the, the, the users of that technology Right. to figure out how to best uh, uh, kind of build it so that it actually serves a purpose. Yeah. So it's, it's pretty rare that you're successful by uh, not uh, investigating in advance. What right, it's... although there's a difference between talking to the, the radiologist, right, and talking to the company that employs the radiologist. So our, our, the question is whether these companies are consulting with the, the company and what they want, or they're actually consulting with the worker and how to make their job better. And, um, I, I don't think you can do this uh, over the dead body of radiologists right, regardless. Right. So, <laughs> but the radiologists um, are quite powerful if we're talking about another, another type of job where the workers maybe have less power than them. I mean, I think a lot of radiologists are actually quite enthusiastic about this. Yeah. They, they, they don't see this necessarily as a threat. They, they see this actually as an opportunity. Right. Uh, and and uh, I mean, they, they, they are, I mean, this is, this is certainly going to affect radiology. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't want to say revolutionize because it may not be the case. It might be gradual. But... Uh, but this is going to have a, a big effect on medicine in general, and uh, radiology in particular. I mean, people are, uh, you know, the objective that a lot, a lot of us are trying to, uh, to optimize is, uh, you know, saving lives, making lives better, and things like this. I mean, most people have uh, this, you know, behind their, their back, you know, behind their, their mind, you know, mm -hmm. the back of their mind as, as what they want to do with their lives. So otherwise, they wouldn't have picked this, this kind of profession, right. uh, perhaps. Now, perhaps the employers don't have this motivation, but they can't do it without their employees, so. Okay. Um, so, as we discussed, I'm very interested in careers, and um, I, to make this somewhat personal, I know you have three sons, and so I'd be interested to know what kind of career advice you've given your sons in terms of, since you know, have a, probably a better sense of what's coming in the future than other people do, what, how have you advised your sons in terms of being successful? Right. In the so future? even uh, or yoga son finished his, his studies a while ago. So um, you know my, my advice at the time might have been different. Uh, <laughs> although although the, the younger the younger one actually studied uh, data science, so that yeah. has to do with machine learning and yeah. things like that. Um, uh, but the, I, I think the, the okay. So the first thing I I, I need to say is a, is a terrible confession, which is that I'm not an economist. Obviously, <laughs> I'm a I'm, you know I'm a I'm a scientist. I'm a geek, but I'm I'm, I'm not an economist. So what I'm going to say is to be taken with a grain of salt. But but thinking about how automation changes the value of things, 
Um, we, you, you can take a very simple example. You can, uh, you can go to a local electronic store and buy a Blu-ray player for 46 bucks. Uh, maybe 50 Canadians. Um, <laughs> and you know, it's very cheap. It's an incredibly sophisticated piece of technology. It uses inventions that didn't exist 10 years ago, like you know, H.264 MPEG compression and blue lasers and things like this. Uh, very, very sophisticated, and it's you know basically 50 bucks. Now, if you want to buy a, a handmade ceramic bowl, the technology is about 10,000 years old, um, but you want it to be handmade, you know, hand design and handmade, it's going to cost you at least $500. And so, what that tells you is the difference between sort of the authentic human experience versus the stuff that's made automatically by machines, essentially. Even though there is a lot of human knowledge that goes into it, in the end, the production and the marginal cost is very low. Um, so I think uh, that difference in value has increased over time. And you're going to see a, a, a continuous increase in the difference of value of things that have sort of authentic human touch and things that are essentially done by machines, which is going to become very cheap. The, the, the price of this is just going down. Um, uh, another example, a similar example, is that you know, you, uh, if you are a opera fan or a jazz fan like I am, you, you can you know, download a, your favorite piece of music for you know, a dollar or maybe five dollars if it's a, a long one. Uh, you want to go to a, a, an opera performance, um, uh, even though the opera might be subsidized uh, by donors or governments, it's going to cost you about 200 bucks. The best seat is, you know, will go for 800 bucks. So again, the difference is the authentic human experience. So things that have direct human-to-human -human communication, where there is a communication of human emotion, um, are things that we're going to give a lot of value to. And uh, things that can be automated is, uh, are just going to become cheaper. So we're going to give a lot less value to material goods, a lot more value to human experience. And it's already the case. So you told your sons to become opera singers? No, so one of them, <laughs> one of them, is, one of them uh, uh, studied law, he's yeah. a lawyer. Um, second one is a mathematician, and the uh, third one is uh, actually majored in economics and uh, mm -hmm. also studied com uh, computer science and data science. Uh, you know, and again, this was before a bit of, uh, of what, you know, what all the events that, that occurred recently about, uh, about AI. I think what, what I would recommend uh, people is to learn things that have a long shelf life. So, uh, uh, and, and sort of specialized, not specialized, but sort of uh, things that make you unique. So if you have a particular combination of skills that don't exist uh, very often, if you uh, learn things that have a long shelf life, like, for example, mathematics and physics, you know, that's not going to change very much. Uh, and you would think that because computers are good at computation, you know, scientists would be useless, but that's not the case, at least not for a very long time. Uh, so, you know, we might talk again in 30 or 40 years, and things might be different if we figure out how to build more intelligent machines. But I think, ultimately, there will still be, uh, you know, AI systems will be uh, out of service. There will be an amplification of intelligence and not a replacement. Uh, the, the same way our, you know, the, the complex part of our neural cortex is actually subservient to our reptilian brain. <laughs> and um, you mentioned once before uh, philosophy. Why, why is philosophy a, a, a good thing for somebody to study? Oh, so, uh, it's just, yeah, I mean, it's another confession I have to make. I, I actually came, became interested in machine learning through philosophy. I was an engineering student, but stumbled on a book that was debate between uh, uh, Jean Piaget, the uh, Swiss uh, uh, cognitive scientist, and, uh, and Noam Chomsky, the, the linguist. And it was basically a, a nature-nurture debate where uh, Chomsky was arguing that language is essentially innate, and Piaget was saying, no, there is some structure, but we actually learn. And I found that fascinating. And I, there was an article in one of those, uh, uh, in, in this book, uh, one of the people arguing for Piaget's side uh, was a gentleman by the name of uh, Seymour Papert, and he, he was a mathematician at MIT and and computer scientist, and he uh, studied in the 60s the perceptron model, and he was talking about the perceptron, the machine that could learn, and mm. I, this was the first time I heard about this, and I was fascinated and looked at the entire literature. That's what got me hooked into okay. this domain. Hmm. That's interesting. And so do you, how important do you think it is that everybody become sort of technologically literate? Is that going to be an important skill in the future? Well, it's already the case, right? I mean, we, we are considerably, everyone in this room, uh, you know, everyone in the world is considerably more uh, technology sophisticated than the average person you know, 30 years ago or 50 years ago or let alone 100 years ago. So that goes with the time. But do we need to know, does everyone need to learn how to code? So 
in the sense that learning to code is another way of sort of reducing a complex uh, uh, problem to a simple set of instruction, which is sort of a very basic uh, uh, skill that people need to have. You know, it, we, we used to say, right, uh, in sort of classical education, European education in the mid 20th century, you had to learn Latin. Um, why? I mean, it's not clear. Or you even had to learn math, even if, you know, ultimately your I mean, math basically has replaced Latin you know, right. for that purpose, but it's you know, basically to sort of build your, your mind, right, and know how to think. And uh, coding is one of those things that uh, make you uh, uh, think about how you reduce a complex problem into simple operations and things like this. So it's not like everybody has to be a programmer or a computer scientist, but the, the basic skill of, uh, that is required for coding, I think, is a very good skill to have, yes. Um, so thinking about how we should prepare for the future, um, let's start with educational institutions since mm -hmm. we're both from them. How, how do you see educational institutions as uh, potentially needing to adapt and change in, 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 with technology and AI in mind in the future? So the, the first thing perhaps is that the, the technological progress is accelerating. Yeah. And it's, and, and educational institutions are known for, for their conservatism and their, their slow change. I'm shocked by that statement, shocked. yes. <laughs> I'm sure everyone here is shocked as well. Uh, so I think it's going to be increasingly difficult for uh, academia to keep up with uh, technological transitions. And you see certain schools, um, uh, you know, the transition, for example, the, the, the success, the recent success of, of AI and deep learning, uh, some of the more conservative schools actually completely missed the boat on this. The, the, the schools that are the most innovative in that, uh, in that respect are the ones that took a chance and invested in this area. That includes the University of Montreal, that includes uh, McGill, that includes uh, NYU, where I, where I teach. Yeah. Um, uh, but some of the best known uh, uh, names in the, in the business in the US um, are actually falling behind a little bit. Yeah. They're trying to catch up now. So um, I think, um, you, you know, institutions will have to find ways to, to, to combat uh, excessive conservatism in that, in that respect. Uh, but also, I think, concentrate on uh, not necessarily teaching students what is useful right now, but what could be useful for their entire career. So people are, because of fast technological changes, it's already the case. I mean, you know much more about this than I do, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, you know, people don't keep the same job their entire career, right? Yeah. They change, um, they change uh, uh, career pretty, pretty often. And so, you know, people need to learn the, the basic skills that will allow them to, uh, to learn. So it's learning to learn. It's not learning things. It's learning to learn, really, that becomes more important than anything else. Yeah. yeah. And then finally, uh, what do you think uh, government or society more broadly, what can people be thinking about or should be thinking about now to ensure sort of the, the more positive rather than the more dystopian future? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, Again, I have, to, I have to say I'm not an economist no, and I'm certainly not a politician, but uh, I think it's more of a political question than a technical question. So clearly the progress of, of technology is, uh, seems to be causing a uh, increase in wealth and income inequality. Okay. And uh, governments will have to find ways to uh, correct for that. And you know, it's, al it's already happening. It's not due to AI, AI has nothing special in that respect. I mean, people think there is some qualitative difference uh, about AI that will make it uh, even uh, you know, qualitatively different from other technological progress. I don't actually believe so. I think, I think it's, uh, it's sort of the same phenomenon that we observe you know, uh, in all of technology. So you know, going back to the first industrial revolution, uh, when um, um, you know, most of the population in North America and Europe was working in the fields and you know, 60 years later or 100 years later, it's 2%. And you know, those, those transformations occur. It's not that the number of jobs uh, decreases. You know, new jobs are created. That, uh, there's a lot of people today you know, work on jobs that didn't exist 10 years ago. So, um, so I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not worried about the fact that sort of job, jobs will be taken away by, by robots. That's not the issue. Um, uh, someone said, I think we're, we're not going to run out of jobs until we run out of problems. <laughs> uh, I think it's, you know, interesting uh, remark. Uh, but certainly the, 
the concentration of, of, uh, of, of wealth and, uh, and income is a, is a problem that governments will have to deal with. It's a political issue, it's not a technological issue. And figuring out how to, there's also losers, right? And I think what we sometimes miss is how do we deal with losers? And an interesting aspect of careers is often that we do have a lot of upfront investment in those skills. And when you lose your job at age 50, that's a much bigger challenge. And I think public right. policy, we haven't quite figured out how to support those those people who doesn't make sense to go back and learn a whole new skill at age 50 and it's a big challenge. Yeah, absolutely. So I was, um, so this is something I was actually more worried about in the past than I am now after talking to a number of economists. I actually participated in a meeting that was sponsored by uh, CIFAR, the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research and NBER, National Bureau of Economics Research in the US, that took place in Toronto a few weeks ago uh, with uh, a bunch of um, very well-known economists. And, there's something I understood there, which is that I, I was worried that um, as, the, as technological progress accelerates, more and more people are left behind because their skills are not in phase with the skills that are required by the new economy. And so you have uh, you know, what has been called uh, uh, technological unemployment, right? people right. who don't have the skills that are required for the new economy. And, and as technology accelerates, you, you might get more and more of those people left behind. But the thing is, um, uh, a lot of economists who have studied the history of, uh, of, of this say that the diffusion of technology in the economy and in society, the speed at which the, the technology penetrates the economy is actually limited by, by how fast people can learn about it. Mm -hmm. So if you think about computer technology, right, it appeared in the 70s or so, but it's not until the 90s that you started seeing a, an increase in productivity uh, in the economy. There was sort of a J curve where, you know, initially the technology was disruptive, so the productivity kind of went down, and then 20 years later it went up, and you know, for a number of years. Uh, and they say that the same thing might occur with AI. So they, they qualify AI as, as what they call a GPT, a general purpose technology, which is something that will, it really surprised me when I heard this, but uh, something that will sort of penetrate all corners of the economy and change uh, just about everything that, that goes on. But that process, generally takes 10 to 20 years. Uh, and it's limited by how fast people, people can learn the skills that are required. So the fact that uh, people can't learn the, the skills at infinite speed is the, is the main factor that limits the, the speed at which the technology is deployed. Uh, and so that limits the amount of people that will be technologically unemployed. So the, so your, the theory is that the, that the technology will slow down until people can catch up. That's right. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we now have uh, a short Q&A session, and we've asked a cross-section of guests, uh, to, and we're invited in advance to ask a few questions. And our first guest is uh, Madame Louise Poisson. Uh, she is the Directrice Scientifique de Fonds de Recherche Société et Culture Gouvernement de Quebec. Thank you very much for this very interesting uh, presentation and discussion. Uh, slightly uh, disturbing, but uh, nevertheless <laughs> very inspiring. Um, ma question, je crois que vous pouvez, uh, vous comprenez bien le français. Oui. Uh, J'aimerais savoir, uh, uh, à votre avis, uh, comment les institutions, les universités, uh, dans cet environnement très compétitif, uh, peuvent faire pour attirer, retenir les talents. Oui, alors bien sûr, euh, c'est un problème pour les universités, étant donné qu'il y a énormément de, de compétition avec euh, l'industrie en ce moment et beaucoup de, de jeunes euh, diplômés qui auraient dans le passé considéré une, une carrière euh, à l'université, en fait, euh, créer des startups ou vont travailler dans l'industrie. Euh, en fait, je pense que ça va redéfinir la relation entre les, certaines industries et l'université. Euh, en prenant mon cas personnel, par exemple, euh, je, je suis directeur de Facebook Air Research, mais aussi toujours professeur à NYU. Et ce n'est pas quelque chose qui est très fréquent en informatique, mais c'est quelque chose qui est relativement fréquent, euh, justement, dans les, dans les business schools, dans les écoles de droit, euh, dans, euh, en médecine, euh, etc. Donc, euh, je pense que ça va un petit peu redéfinir la relation. Il y a de plus en plus de gens qui ont un poste académique et qui vont passer du temps dans l'industrie euh, à temps partiel, ou le contraire, des gens de l'industrie qui auront des affiliations avec l'université. 
Euh, c'est le cas, par exemple, à Facebook Air Research. Deux chercheurs de Facebook Air Research à New York sont affiliés à NYU et, euh, sont, et supervisent des étudiants en doctorat, par exemple. Mais c'est un problème, c'est sûr. Uh, our second question asker is Helge, Mr. Helge Stiesen, general partner and CEO of Tandem Launch, a consumer electronics company. Uh, he's a technologist and an entrepreneur. Hello, thank you very much for uh, the dialogue and the insights. Uh, at the very beginning, you talked about the distinction between uh, uh, sort of the, the general AI that everybody's dreaming of when they're talking often in the public space about uh, AI and the, um, uh, you know, the deep learning techniques that we currently have that are more for short-term analysis of information. Um, what, what do you see as the path towards general AI? And specifically, what role do you believe deep learning will play in that, uh, in that transition, if, if at all? given its limitations? So I think deep learning is, uh, is certainly part of the answer, part of the solution. So the, the basic idea of, of deep learning is, um, it's a bit like um, the, the, the way you build a deep learning system is that you have a sort of a, uh, a, a toolbox of basic uh, functional blocks and you assemble them into a complex circuit, if you want. It's called a compute graph, but it's the same thing. It's basically a circuit, and then each of those boxes parameterized, and you train the machine to do a particular task. That idea that you can build, uh, sort of architect uh, a circuit of sort of complex parameterized function, and you train them on data, is not going to go away. So that concept of deep learning is not going to go away. That's going to be part of the solution. We're all, all almost certain of that. Now, what we need, though, is a different paradigm for learning. Uh, I briefly mentioned this. So there's currently three paradigms for learning. One is called uh, supervised learning, which I, I talked about. Another one is called reinforcement learning. Reinforcement learning is basically a scenario where you don't tell the machine the correct answer, but you only tell it whether it did good or bad. And so it's a much weaker feedback that you give to the machine. It's much harder for it to learn anything. It needs more trials to learn things. And then there's a third scenario uh, that you know, some people call unsupervised learning or I call predictive learning, where is the learning that's more similar to what humans and animals do, where you, you learn how the world works by observing the world and by acting in it. And the, the, it's, it's the third type that we don't know how to do. And that's the path, I think, to, uh, to artificial general intelligence, AGI. Until we clear that, that obstacle, I think we're going to have a, we're going to be limited in the, the, the applications of, a, of AI that we can, we can build. Now, uh, the analogy perhaps we could use is that this is the first mountain that we see that we have to clear, but there might be 50 mountains behind that we're not seeing yet. Uh, and the history of AI uh, has been, uh, in the, in, you know, in the last 50 years or 60 years, uh, uh, has been one of considerable underestimation of the difficulty of the problem. So a lot of, you know, AI researchers said, oh, we're going to have machines as intelligent as humans in 20 years, and that was back in the 60s. Or, you know, we're going to you know, have a summer project for a couple of students to solve the computer vision problem, right? That was in 1964. Um, you know, we only started partially solving it in the last few years. So, so you know, people underestimate how difficult it is. Uh, we see this first obstacle of unsupervised or predictive learning. Uh, and many of us are working on this uh, at Facebook. Yoshi Benjo uh, is working on this. A bunch of his lab is working on this. Uh, a lot of people are working on this in Toronto and various other institutions. So this is... Uh, you know, well recognized as a, as a, as a problem. Um, uh, you know, people used to think that you could do everything with either supervised learning or reinforcement learning, and uh, I, I don't believe that's the case. Okay, our third question asker is Ms. Alexandra Deval, uh, a fourth year BCom student at the Des Hotel Faculty of Management and co-president of the McGill Data Network. Hello, thank you again. Um, as a student, I'm, and this was touched upon in the discussion, but I was hoping to elaborate further as I am a student. Um, so students now are graduating into jobs that didn't even exist when they started university. So I just wanted to elaborate on the advice you would have for students on how to prepare for this dynamic workplace, both inside and outside their education. Yes, yeah, so I partially answered that question before, okay. but uh, I think you know, learning, learning um, uh, basic knowledge that has a long shelf life and that you, you need to learn when you're young. And that means, you know, very basic things like mathematics and physics. You know, I'm, I'm a geek, so that's, that's what I say. You know, there's other things that you need to learn as well. You know, 
critical thinking and perhaps you know philosophy and things of that type, but uh, but things that that you need to devote a significant amount of brain power uh, when when you're when you're still still young uh, because it's harder to learn later, and the 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 operational skills of uh, things that are required by the, your, your current, you know, your, your potential employers are considerably less important to learn when you're at school because you can, you can pick this up once, once you start your job. So in the context of computer science where I know, you know, you can take a course on, you know, mobile device programming or something, you know, program an app on, on uh, iPhone or, 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 or Android. And, you know, it might, it might land you a job quickly, but it's almost certain that five or ten years from now that would be completely useless. And so, you know, the, the, the skills for this would be required would be completely different. And so, you know, it would have been much better to take a course in applied math or in, you know, uh, operation research or optimization or, uh, or, you know, differential equations or something like that. You know, something where you, there is some basic methods that you, that, that you learn and you may not think they are connected with anything practical, but in fact, uh, they teach you how to think. I give my students a speech about this at the beginning of each class, that I'm teaching them critical thinking and right. not just learning the, the particular materials. There's been a lot of emphasis on that. Uh, our fourth question asker is Monsieur Philippe Crevier. He is Conseiller Syndical Dossier Valorisation Service Public, FSSS, CSN, which is a, a labor union. Merci. Um, Je me demandais si vous, on, on pouvait, dans le fond, anticiper les effets de, de, du virage euh, en matière de, justement de relations de travail, quelles conséquences ça aurait pour les organisations syndicales, par exemple, en matière de négociation de conventions collectives, de résolution des litiges, d'exercice même du droit d'association, par exemple, sur la taille des euh, organisations syndicales, sur l'exercice du, du droit de grève, du lock-out. Dans le fond, comment va évoluer le syndicalisme au fil de cette transformation-là? Anticipez-vous anticipez -vous plus une dynamique de résistance ou une, et de conflit, ou plutôt une dynamique de concertation et d'accompagnement? Euh, au fond, est-ce que je vais avoir encore un travail dans 5-10 ans? C'est ça ma question. <rire> euh, je pense que justement, je, je parlais de l'augmentation de la valeur qu'on donnera aux interactions humaines directes, et ce genre d'activité, évidemment, tombe dans cette catégorie d'interactions humaines directes. Euh, donc je pense que le, 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 le métier de, ou disons l'utilité du, du, du syndicaliste ne va pas, euh, ne va pas décroître, au contraire. Euh, maintenant, quelle va être l'influence du dé, déploiement de la technologie sur, euh, sur, sur, sur le, le travail, euh, etc. Euh, je ne suis pas la bonne personne à qui poser cette question. Encore une fois, je ne suis, suis pas économiste, ni, ni, euh, ni, ni, ni politicien, ni financier. Euh, et je ne connais pas très bien le, le, le marché du travail euh, en général et particulièrement au, au Canada et au Québec. Euh, mais bon, c'est clair qu'il va y avoir des, des transformations, euh, un risque de concentration des, 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 des pouvoirs, des revenus et des richesses euh, qui va devoir être accompagné de décisions gouvernementales pour modérer un peu ces, les effets. Euh, on va peut-être assister à une nouvelle organisation de la société ou à un, un nouveau contrat social. Euh, et euh, je ne suis, vous êtes probablement dans une bien meilleure position de, de prédire ça que moi. Je, je, suis un, je suis chercheur en intelligence artificielle. Euh, et je, je voudrais pouvoir possiblement avoir une influence là-dessus, mais je ne crois pas que ce soit une bonne idée parce que euh, je n'ai pas la science infuse du tout sur ce, sur ce, sur ce domaine. Euh, mais je pense que c'est quelque chose auquel il faut réfléchir. Alors, euh, une des, euh, une, une des, des, des actions auxquelles j'ai participé récemment, c'est la création d'un groupe qui s'appelle Partnership on AI. Euh, et ce, ce groupement est, a été à l'origine créé par des, des grandes compagnies américaines, Facebook, Google, IBM, Microsoft, Amazon euh, et Apple. Et, Et, mais euh, le, le, le groupe euh, regroupe des, des, des organisations non, euh, non gouvernementales, des, euh, euh, des associations de droits civiques, euh, euh, probablement dans, dans le futur aussi des, des syndicats et d'autres euh, euh, partenaires sociaux, etc., pour justement discuter de ce genre de questions euh, ouvertement. C'est-à-dire que... Euh, il y a des questions euh, d'éthique et d'influence sur la société, sur le déploiement de, de l'intelligence artificielle, et ces discussions doivent être faites euh, en public et, et pas dans les, dans les bureaux euh, fermés de chacune de ces compagnies. 
c'est très difficile, en, plus, en tout cas pour ces compagnies aussi, d'établir de, de, des, des règles et des, euh, des, des, des lignes de conduite en fait, pour, euh, pour ce genre de déploiement. Donc c'est quelque chose que chacune de ces compagnies en fait, veut discuter avec euh, les partenaires pour euh, ne pas faire de bêtises. Et puis surtout aussi pour aider les plus petites compagnies qui n'ont pas les ressources pour réfléchir à ce genre de, de choses, euh, à, à en fait, euh, euh, avoir des, des, des recommandations, des lignes de conduite, des standards, etc. Donc, par, par exemple, justement, pour euh, essayer de limiter le, 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 le biais dans les, les systèmes d'apprentissage, pour s'assurer que les euh, procédés de test des systèmes d'apprentissage sont tels qu'on peut assurer leur fiabilité, ce qui est très important pour euh, les voitures autonomes, par exemple, ou pour la médecine. Euh, donc, euh, je pense que ce, ce, ce genre de, de groupement, en fait, va être très important pour discuter de ce genre de, ce genre de choses. So this, this partnership in AI, um, I got most of your conversation, my French is, is almost there. Uh, I like to tell people I'm an American, so I have an excuse for not, right. my French not being perfect. Um, so are there already labor unions and representatives of labor in partnership in that group, or is that something you'd like to have involved? Okay, so I... Um, I, I can't, I can't, I, I don't actually know the list of all the, the, all yeah. the members right now, but, uh, you know, for example, in the U.S., the SELU is a member, okay. UNESCO is a member, okay. um, and, uh, you know, a number of uh, companies across the world. So it's not just, you know, it's not an American thing, it's, yeah. uh, um, it's, it's, it's uh, worldwide and, um, uh, you know, involves um, uh, partners from, from all kinds of different types of organization that, you know, We'll have something to say about this, yeah. and, and we'll participate in committees and discussions. And do you feel like the, that uh, that that organization is going to be successful in influencing the development of AI more broadly? Are people taking it seriously? Well, so it's it's just the beginning. You know, yeah. we we just named the executive director. Uh, in fact, it's not it's not yet officially announced. Mm. Uh, I think it's going to be officially announced in two weeks or so. But um, So, so it's just the beginning, and, and we're starting to set up uh, committees, the activities are, are discussing. I think it's going to be su successful to the extent that it brings together the, the, the people who are, you know, who can bring something to the, 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 the kind of reflection we're, 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 we're talking about, the, 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 the thinking around, around those questions, and to the extent that the, the partnership can make recommendations that are practical, either for companies that are involved through uh, uh, social organizations of various kinds that are involved, uh, you know, that defend, uh, you know, privacy, for example, or civil liberties or things like that, or, or, or you know, labor unions, uh, as well as governments. Uh, governments need to be informed. And, you know, um, there's very little, uh, uh, you know, scientific culture in governments in, in most countries. And so, There is, I think, a, a duty to inform uh, the, you know, the people who might need to make decisions about this. Right. right. Great. Uh, I want to uh, ask everyone to join me in thanking Jan Lequin for joining us and Thank sharing you. his time. We have a small program. Thank you. And, uh, thanks. All right.